our New Yorkers and friends and Greg Gisberg, who we call Gis or Gissy. So if you hear those names, you know who I'm talking about. I do apologize for starting late. Uh, the issue was on my end. We tested yesterday and we had technical difficulties in system preferences. Since I am a Mac genius, super geek, I found uh, the sound was set correct, but I flicked back and forth and got my sound back. So uh, I'm gonna bring my guests in. And first of all, I was wondering if we could agree that Bobby Shue is a genius as far as playing trumpet and developing the 8310Z. Greg, do you have something to say about that? And then Mags? Well, uh, my understanding is that uh, over the course of working with Yamaha, that he had enhanced a horn that he had discovered over there in Japan when he was touring with Toshiko Akiyoshi. So... I I really don't know the inner workings of the modifications, but certainly uh, it's it's a great horn. I just got one of the second generation eighty three ten Zs, and I love it. It's fantastic. Well, he told me he had five Martins, and none of them to him worked really well. And are you there, and Richard? That, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh oh, we are muted. Uh, Joe, could you speak up? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, Rich, can you hear? There, there you can are. Can you hear Joe? Okay. Can, no. Can you I, hear me? I can hear okay. you. I can hear Rich. Okay, Joe. Okay, speak. We're, good then. we're good. Oh, are you talking about you were on the screen by yourself? That's modern technology. I just wanted you to speak, and I put you on the screen. So don't mind that, guys. I'm going to do that once in a while and i should explain that formally but um bobby shoe had five different martin committees and he said none of them worked really properly and uh that's how he developed the 8310z and then i just bought a flugelhorn which is an 8310z and i love them now joe is switched to a shoki now and uh, yeah. the thing about Joe is no matter what he uses, I kind of joke with other people, not with Joe, that he changes horns like I change socks. But Joe sounds great on any horn that I've ever heard on recordings or live. So, Joe, could you tell us about your setup, your mouthpiece in, in the Shulky? Yeah, I'm playing a, a Shulky B7, I guess, from the early 70s, I think it was made. And um, um, I have a Giardinelli 7S mouthpiece with a four backbore I want to get really technical because Dave Rogers uh, who is kind of a very well uh, educated uh, trumpet player on impedance and and I guess like how the you know backboard fits the thing you know so he's he gave me this four backboard and that's that's what I use yeah but I was, I, was, I was playing the eight you know the uh, Bobby's horn uh, the 810 uh, for about nine years before that Wow. And uh, Joe Magarelli sold me his horn. And uh, right, he was one of them. No, my second one. I really never played that horn, but I played that. I, that was my second horn that, yeah, I, that I, I couldn't pass up because it was so nice. I think he brought it by Fat Cat and I played it. And he says, buy that horn. And, uh, <laughs> and Joe let me keep it for a couple months. And I tried it sitting in at Mesro where it sounded great with a small group. And across the street was Joe playing with his wife, who's one of the best organ players I've heard. And I went there and I'm blowing without a mic and playing like my fifth chorus of the blues or something. And I go, you know what? I'm not getting tired, you know? And uh, before I got the 8310Z, Frank Figueroa, who uh, you know, Mags, do you know Frank Figueroa, Gizzy? I do. Oh. And I want to tell you, Richie, I can't hear Joe. Ah, you can't hear Joe. Better off. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to you be better off. bad news. Oh, shucks. So, oh, boy, how, what are we going to do about this? Uh, <clears throat> let me think. Uh, Joe doesn't have his mute button on, that's for sure, because I can um, hear him. No, I don't have my oh, mute button on. That's okay. I wish I would have heard that answer. And I have a uh, joke. Could you hear him at the beginning of the uh, uh, nope. uh, podcast? Nothing. No, when we first, very first did it, then as soon as we went live, 
I lost Joe's audio and vis video. Okay, folks, you'll have to apologize. Joe, could you call Greg by phone and see if he can hear you without a loop feedback? Yeah, I gotta, I gotta get I gotta get my phone. It's in the other room. Yeah, take take your time. I'll talk to Greg a little. And uh, Greg, what is your setup, by the way? I'm using the iPhone. Oh no, the trumpet wise. Oh, I'm using the 8310Z and the Bobby <laughs> Shoe lead piece, and everything. I I've been playing stuff that Bobby Shoe had uh, influenced and designed uh, horns since uh, 1985 actually wow. and i just for me it's, i just think they're the best trumpets for me and yeah and the bobby shoe yeah. yamaha lead mouthpiece and you know he's he's uh he's uh, like hello joe yeah can, can you hear me yeah i can hear you can you hear me i can hear you but you That's you're you're off the me. you're off the screen now I'm coming back. I'm okay. on the screen, though. That's how I'm hearing you. Oh, okay, cool. Where's, where's, where's Rich? Rich, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, cool. Can you see me? Yeah. Okay, well, good. So, uh, uh, ask, um, ask, uh, ask Gizzy to hit the link again. Hit the link again, Giz. Rich says, hit the link again. We'll try this. This will work, you know, because I, I would be getting the feedback. But you too, I don't think it'll it'll be a thing. Greg Giss is ready to join. I see Joe this time. Well, I that's see. fine. I, as I long as you it. guys can hear I, each other. I hear you, Joe. Hey, mute your phone, Joe, and say something. Okay, but I no. Okay, okay. Uh, hold on. How about now? You, you hear anything? No, I don't hear you. Uh, no, and I don't hear you either. So let's keep it like but this. With the phone, I can hear you. Yeah, we're good. I can hear yeah, it's okay, good. Let's do it like this. Hey, Jesse, your picture is like this. Can you straighten that out with the phone or do no, something? Yeah, the only way the phone is stationary. So, so, so it was okay formally, but it's kind of weird now. That's strange. I don't know what to tell right. you. Well, All right, right folks. Uh, whenever uh, Greg Gisberg talks, could you kindly do this? And uh, I think we're going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> that I <like> to do. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. I think we're going to continue this way. I am going to take take off the scroll. Let me see. Stand by. Okay. There we go. Now I got your names up there. Uh, Joe, could you tell me uh, some of the working with the Vanguard Orchestra experience and how much you enjoyed that, I'm sure. I really enjoyed it, man. I still, you know, once in a while I still do it. Um, you do too, I know. Probably Giz too if they're on the West Coast. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, I, I've always loved playing with the band. I think the one thing that separates it from other big bands is that it feels like when you go on the road with that band, it still feels like a small group. You know what I mean? Like, you know, when you're at the Vanguard, when you're playing a solo, you, you feel like you're in a small group. And and they can t actually take that on the road. You know what I mean? They, they do that on the road, too. If they play a concert like in Louisville at the University of Louisville, let's say. You know, I think we did a concert there. You get up and start blowing a solo and you still feel like you're in a small group, which I never really got in a big band before. You know, it's, you know that feeling. So that, yeah. that's one thing I would say, you know. And uh, you worked with uh, Lionel Hampton also? Yeah, I was with, I was, you know, on, on the band, officially on the band for about two years, and then I subbed for another three or four years after that. And you told Mike a nice story about his vibraphones on the uh, bandstand that you could repeat, perhaps. <laughs> well, yeah, the, well, when I went for the audition, actually, it was when I went the, the, in the Carol. Carol Music Studios, 1987, I went to the audition. And when I walked in, I walked right by his vibes. And there was only about, he had like an octave because he had McDonald's. He had his purse, you know, like we carried his stuff, you know, like his hip purse, you know what I mean? Then he had like a 
the coke, he had a couple of coke cans and then some other shit over here. So basically, he had like an octave. He was playing, mm. and, the, and the vibes were just like a tray for all his shit. It was fun. I just, you know, kind of, it was kind of looked strange to me when I first saw it. You know. <laughs> It stuck with me. <laughs> and uh, Kissy, you worked with Woody and Buddy and and uh, and with the Vanguard Orchestra. Anything you could say about big bands as opposed to small groups, or how much you enjoyed working with big bands? Well, uh, big bands are my life. <laughs> uh, well, <for> the most part. <laughs> I, I I never actually aspired to to be a lead trumpet player, but uh, that sort of set my my track into playing with big bands all the time. Where I I love them both. I'm really uh, I haven't played a lot of big bands the last couple of years, and mm. I found that I'm really enjoying improvising and playing in a different way and trying to relearn the basics of small group play. So mm. uh, yeah, but big I you know I. I still love big bands. You know, well, you were you were just so good at it. Like Joe, Joe was um, uh, Joe is like you. First of all, I want to say that I love the way both of you, you guys play, and you're two of my favorite trumpet players in New York, and that means in the world. Joe grew. I mean, he was always a great player, but over the last 10, 15, 20 years, it just just. Every time I hear him, there's something new. Now, when Gissy came on the scene, Greg Gisberg, I would say it was frightening because Greg <laughs> was a prodigy. And John Marshall said something. I don't know if he remembers this. He goes, he had, John was an expat, and he said, now I got to contend with a guy who plays double I, high A's and plays like that. I mean, Gissy is like one of those, I think one of the first guys I heard like that was Glenn Drews who could play jazz and lead. Right, Joe? Yeah. And when I heard Gissy, I said, holy cow. You know, the, the way this guy plays lead and the way he plays in Maria Schneider's band, it, it was frightening. And it still is. And and I would say the same thing for Joe. So uh, is there something uh, each of you guys could say about what you, how you would prepare yourself as a musician today uh, uh, coming to New York City to survive? Uh, so you, uh, for instance, Gissy, you went to a Berkeley school. I thought it was North Texas State, but it was Berkeley. But uh, who called you to come to New York, or did you come just out of an urge to play? Oh, uh, I had uh, I had more. I knew more people from Buddy Rich's band and Woody Herman's band that moved to New York than to L.A. That was really the deciding factor. I had more friends in New York. Uh, and I was pretty naive, extremely naive. I remember I, I wanted to, uh, I went to the first, like, Toshiko rehearsal, and I watched every note go by, and I called my dad and said, I want to come home. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And uh, Max is uh, up, upstate. And Right there, Joe. You're from Syracuse, is it? Syracuse, New York. Yeah, and, and what made you decide to come to New York City? Um, I came to New York when I was eight years old with my family, and I vowed that I was going to move to New York. Plus, I was a New York Knicks fan and New York Giants fan, and I knew my future wasn't in Syracuse, <clears throat> so. I thought about moving to Los Angeles and I went out there for a minute before I came to New York, but I was advised <laughs> by some prominent LA cats that if I wanted to play jazz, I should probably just move to Syracuse and then move back to move to New York. I mean, go back to Syracuse and move to New York. So that's what I did. And that was good advice actually. But yeah, I've always wanted to move to New York. It wasn't, the, it wasn't for jazz really. I just wanted to live here, you know? Well, you also have written for strings and uh, no, I didn't write for strings. No, no, no. I I did a I collaborated with Marty Scheller, uh -huh. and he wrote the arrangements. I mean, I did my original music, and I, you know, I I definitely uh, maybe uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, maybe gave him a lead sheet of kind of the sound that I wanted. You know, as far as structure of 
chords maybe, but he did the writing. No, I didn't do the writing. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, but but you played guitar early on, and you played piano every day, which of course helps your arranging, which is very important to me. I tell people my arranging is like improvising at a very slow tempo. I love arranging, and I kind of yeah. got my arranging chops together not just by going to the BMI class with uh, Brookmeyer and Manny Album. Bob Brookmeyer, who wrote for the Vanguard Orchestra. But it was after I left them, Chris Byers had me in his octet, and I would write until I finally got something good enough called Village Beauty that he liked and he played and he actually recorded. And now I write for my own octet and I write for big bands. But I love playing piano and, and writing, and that's always been super important to me. Uh, Greg, you wanted to ask me something yesterday about the uh, – Vanguard Orchestra, I think, about the rhythm section. Oh, it's, I, I can't recall what I wanted to ask, but I do have a couple questions for Joe, actually. Good, please. Uh, one, question one is, uh, are, are you and Akiko getting to play at home? Um, we played once. Um, because somebody uh, came over to uh, take a little video of her, and so she needed to play a few tunes, and I, I did one with her, but not really, man. We've just been practicing, you know, separately. But, you know, it's coming soon. We're going to start playing soon, probably, because I, I just want to start playing. <laughs> I'm just tired of practicing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hear you. And you? Well, please say hello. Oh, please th say hello. Thank you. Oh, me? I, I haven't, uh, I haven't uh, played much. I kind of, I was a little bit in, in uh, like everyone, a little bit set back and a little bit in kind of shock, not major shock, but as this reality of the pandemic is settling in, and thinking about all my friends, all our friends in New York City, and knowing people that are passing from this pandemic, yeah. it, it kind of, it, it, it hits hard, and, and uh, we're doing everything we can. Uh, at home, my fiance and I, we're doing everything we can to be safe, and we're not scared. But this this is a real thing, so I had I had to get out of my funk by starting from scratch and playing long tones. So that's it. I sound like a beginner right now, and it's really <laughs> fun. Actually, I'm, I'm loving it. That happened to me when I changed my armor shirt. And by the way, for your show. Was how has if if it, this has happened? How has your your sports uh, background in terms of practice and preparation influenced how you prepare for play? Because I watch your discipline, and it's it's it, I'm in awe of your discipline and your focus and organization, and it makes you it helps make you such a great musician. Oh, thank you, Greg. Something I have great admiration for. Thank you, man. And. Thank you, man. How do you do that? I have no clue. Well, <laughs> you know, to be honest, man, and I'm not just saying this, bro, to be honest, so, but, you know, the, the day you said you came to Toshko's rehearsal, remember that? You know, well, I was there, too. Yeah. We were there together. I remember. I remember. Yeah, and you played, oh, you played Warning, Success May Be Hazardous to Your Health. And I know, Richie, you played that tune, too, and you sounded beautiful on that tune also. But I remember that day, you know, people told me how good you were. But I had I hadn't heard you, and you played that tune like you wrote the tune. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't believe it, man. I was like, "Wow!" Is it? You know, no offense to anybody, but that was just the you know best trumpet playing I had heard besides Freddie Hubbard and you know a few other the cats. And and uh, so being on that band with you for those years, and then with Scott, I just felt like I had such a long way to go. So I, I tried to use my sports the way I kind of became a, a halfway decent basketball player, I tried to apply that to the trumpet just by, you know, like doing daily things every day, do the same thing. But hopefully that thing is something that's making you better. And that's kind of, yeah, that's it. <laughs> but I had, you know, to be honest, man, like being in New York, you know, I, I, I wasn't, I never went to, I didn't go to music school, although I had great teachers, but I, you know, I wasn't immersed in music. So when I came to New York was the first time I was immersed in music for the first time, you know, because I was a bartender. I was, you know, I was, I was a janitor, a bartender, you know, I did all kinds of shit just so I wouldn't have to get a real job, 
you know. <laughs> See, I didn't know that about you, Joe. I I didn't know most of the yeah. musicians I know never had a day gig. But uh, when no, I, I, had, I was a bartender, I did all kinds of shit. Man. And yeah. When I moved to New York, I cleaned toilets. I was a uh, uh, janitor at uh, in inside of uh, a clothing store in the Empire State Building. And you two guys right. went to college when I was. Uh, 17, I moved to Boston and I was working in strip clubs at the age of 18. I <laughs> so my training was a slightly different. I was working at a place called The Living Room, owned by Skinny Pete Fumora, who's in a book called My Life in the Mafia. And uh, I guess I still have a soft spot for strippers because of that. So I like to listen to Lenny Bruce. Now, what, uh, what uh, uh, Gisty asked me yesterday was, what was it like working with Mel? And I kind of have almost a uh, photographic memory for certain things and try to remember changes and, and solos and stuff. Not quite, not the way Woody Shaw had. But uh, playing with Mel uh, was, as opposed to Buddy, he asked me about that. To me, it's like driving a really comfortable, tight uh, Toyota uh, compared to driving a Mack truck. And Buddy was like a Mack truck. I mean, and, and Mel was like, like a small group. It was incredible when the big band dropped out and you just played with him and the bass player. It was Dennis Irwin then. And the trumpets were, uh, as Joe knows, it was uh, Errol Gardner, who we affectionately called Bird, uh, because he was so large. It, they called him Big Bird originally. And uh, it was short in the bird because he lost so much weight. Uh, second trumpet was Glenn Drews. Uh, uh, Joe, Mazzello, uh, Joe Mazzello, and then third trumpet was uh, Glenn Drews, and I think Jim Powell was fourth, and he's been replaced by one of the most amazing trumpet players who you mentioned, Scott Wenthold, wonderful player. So uh, playing with Mel for two years, uh, I subbed for Joe Mazzello because he was doing a Broadway show, so I would only do the first set, and it was one of the best experiences I ever had in my life playing with Mel. And of course, working with Buddy was a whole different trip. But do, do you have anything to uh, say about working with Buddy, uh, Greg? Well, I, you know, I always, I, I wish I had the opportunity to play with Mel. And, uh, and Buddy was one of my childhood heroes as well. So, uh, I, playing with Buddy Rich taught me everything I needed to know to have a chance and having a life and a career in music. And it also taught me everything that would keep that from happening, uh, to be truthful. So it was a very bipolar existence, uh, being on Buddy Rich's band. All, we were all, with, most of us were always on edge, but at the same time, we loved him, we respected him. And there was a point, being on the road with him towards the end of his life, where he realized that we were genuinely grateful to be there. And we knew we couldn't play shit. We were trying to play shit. We knew each other, you know, playing the same 12 tunes every night. We were barely able to keep up with him sometimes. But when the band actually started playing really well, he got off our backs. That's and true. he had fun. You well, know? I would say, but you know, to me, uh, if you didn't... To no, me, his rage, his rage came from the fact that we were dragging. Yeah. <laughs> you want to get, you know? To me, yeah, he, 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 had, he had to carry you cats for a while, right? <laughs> he did. Yeah, when yeah. He saw that we, we were willing to have our asses kicked. He like he kind of changed at the end, the end of his the last like eight months that he was playing. He was hanging out with us in the back of the bus every day, telling stories about playing with all our heroes, laughing his ass off, letting us stretch. It was amazing. He went through a transformation. Wow, man. Wow. That's that heavy. Great. That's deep, yeah. man. Wow, that's heavy. Yeah. It's a genius. <laughs> all right, but, but I, can I ask a, can I ask, can I ask a, a, a follow-up question here? Now you now you also were on the you're also on Woody's band for the his last two weeks. Yes. Can you tell? Can you talk about that? Well, it's, uh, that's when I started. 
started my career as the big bad Grim Reaper. <laughs> <laughs> for, for the first five big bands I was on, the leader died. I thought the FBI was going to be dead. <laughs> I mean, I'm not laughing. I'm not laughing at death. I'm just laughing. At <laughs> <laughs> now, you know what? To go from Buddy Rich's band to Woody Herman's band was very awkward for me because I only knew one way to play, and it was Buddy Rich style. And that vibe, and everything that went with it, all the uh, excessive partying, uh, real kind of. Well, you know, tense environment, and Woody's band was all about, you know, it was a, it was a different thing, and I my ears weren't mature enough to really play in that band at that time. I, I was like, I was closed-minded and, and open-mouthed, so for me, when I went to Woody Herbert's band at first, I, I kind of felt like, man, this is like, like trying to run in molasses or quicksand or something because I didn't understand how to relax and play at the same time. But over time, I learned how to play in Woody's band from like peers, like all the great musicians that are in New York and LA now, uh, like actually like was able to learn the other aspects of how to play other than Buddy Rich. So for me, it was a rude awakening at first to get a uh, depth. Uh, Woody Herman's band, Roger Ingram and Ron Stout, they had my back when I was like being like a complete dumbass. They'd say, chill, chill out, chill, you know? And wow. They'd play music for me from uh, the history of Woody Herman and say, yeah, this is a different thing. This is a totally different vibe. So I learned a lot there, but it took a while to, for me to get acclimated. They're completely different bands. To me, um, well, Fusco used to have some great lines. He said, if you could play jazz with Buddy Rich, you could play jazz with anybody. Now, if you go on the internet, you can hear Buddy screaming at the, screaming at the cats, you got to suck. You look like the house of David Sasson because they had beards. And it's the worst band I ever had. And to me, uh, Buddy would uh, just explode uh, every third or fourth day. It was like almost like clockwork. So... If we worked with Sinatra, Buddy couldn't read, for instance. Uh, so he would lay out, Irv Kotler would play, the band would play, and Buddy, for the next three days, he would say, man, you guys are great. It's the best band. I mean, I'm so lucky to have you cats. And by third or fourth day, he would say something so brilliant and insulting, like, you should be blinded. I mean, I had never heard anybody say something that witty. To, to somebody else, you should be blinded. I'm going, really, but we all love Buddy. I sat in the front of the bus because I admired him so much. So, as much as we love to tell these stories, like uh, Fusco would say, everything sounded like a flat tire, or it was in one, 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 one. <laughs> Buddy was a genius. Uh, uh, drumming wise, he he had he. He would hear a chart played at Carroll Studios one time by a student, sit down and play it perfect, and drive the band like nobody else could. I mean, it was just ferocious. You know? now, now I'd like to talk a little yeah. about uh, how do you guys prepare for New York today? I mean, in the, in the day, the music I listened to was like Lee Morgan, Freddie Hubbard, Blue Mitchell, KD, Clifford Brown, and guys just played jazz. But Greg, you've done many different types of gigs and, and also mags. Uh, I've been in a pit, I've done big bands, I've played rock and roll gigs. How do you prefer, prepare now for coming, young cats coming to New York? Uh, Greg and then Joe, please. Okay, uh, I think, I, I, first of all, I've been out of New York for about five years. I check in every now and then, but uh, <clears throat> I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I have any specific ideas, but it seems like the bar has been raised by every generation that comes along. Uh, so I think the requirements for a trumpet player wanting to freelance in New York and, may, and be mainly playing jazz, or maybe only playing jazz, you have to have some skills mastered that our generations probably didn't. 
Like, for example, they have to be able to play lead, classical, great readers. They know how to arrange, how to compose, uh, how to, uh, public speaking for clinics, uh, production, editing, all of that business stuff. I think the bar has been raised so high that I think young people that want to take that punch, they better make sure they have all those elements covered because the bar has been raised. That's my opinion. That's, I should say, suggestion. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you, man. I, I totally agree with you. I think a lot of it is being able to open yourself up to uh, playing uh, different types of gigs also. Like I play, I was lucky enough to learn later about split lead and eventually I made a, a album called New York Salsa. And I was always reluctant to change equipment. I used a Bach 3C. And eventually, I, uh, Glenn Drews had given me a mouthpiece, uh, Giardinelli, about five or 10 years before. And I decided to try it. And it just worked so well. And then when I got the Yamaha that Joe sold me, it's like they just clicked very well. And I play some lead, I play split lead, I've done Broadway shows. You have to be able to be versatile to come to New York today and play jazz, unless you're very lucky, like a Joe Levan or, or Witten Marcellus. I think uh, that that's pretty much borne out that you have to be more flexible today. You think? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. If, if you want, I mean, if you really want to make money, real money, yeah, you gotta, you gotta. It's, it's tough to be really one-dimensional, you know, I don't know. Well, I think Joe is I'm one of the guys really who managed, Sorry. Joe, Sorry. Joe managed to play jazz exclusively, and I think a lot of that is his not just being a sideman, but being a leader and being able to write and compose. That's helped Joe a lot. Well, I mean, I've never been to – like, when I came to town, I came to town, I wanted to play jazz, you know, but – I, that I got, you know, well, should I, should I try to work on Broadway? Should I try? So I tried different things, but eventually I just said, you know, my talents are really kind of limited. I should just do what I do, you know, and do it and not try to be, uh, you know, because I, you know, I was competing against Greg and, you know, you know, all our generation, we had good trumpet players in our generation. We have good trumpet players in our generation, man, I would say very top shelf trumpet players. You know, you got, we can name 25, I'm sure easily. You know, and, and uh, so I, I never felt like I could compete, you know, on that level. So I just tr I just tried to work on, you know, become, because I started late. You know, I, I wasn't I wasn't like, you know, an early tr a young trumpet player, you know, so so I had my own path. You know what I mean? So, I, I mean, I think what Greg is saying is very true, though. I'm just saying for me, it wasn't really like that. I kind of just stuck with my one thing. And, you know, I'm happy with, you know, what I did. It was, it's fun trying. Let's say let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mentioned, I mentioned that, you know, I mentioned that you and Scott really inspire me, but I have to say, Greg, you know, having somebody like you in my generation and Wallace Roney and, uh, you know, Roy, you know, that's something to shoot for, man. And I, I haven't been, I haven't gotten there yet. You'll always be, you're always going to be winner and champion, baby, man. I, I understand that. I and mean, I'm happy with that. I'm just glad that I'm, you know, uh, it's fun trying. As Jerry Dodson said, it's just fun trying. <laughs> well, never. My, I think the point also is never be afraid. If Kenny Dorham was afraid of Dizzy, there would have never been a Kenny Dorham. You know, exactly. or Lee Morgan. Same thing for Lee. Dizzy, you told me something a long time ago. You know, uh, Miles Davis said it's really hard to develop your own style to sound like yourself. Dizzy told me something very interesting about taking. Uh, see, I remember this. Is he took uh, sandwich bags and he put lines in them. People call them licks. I'd like to call them lines. And they were from Scott Wethold or other trumpet players. And he would spread them out in the bed and they would uh, put out his two, two fives, dominant. Could you talk a little about that learning method, Greg? Well, in, in short, I, I found theory to be very confusing and complicated until I, until I was about 35 years old. And then I was like, oh, I can use theory now. But I really didn't want to be found out how little I knew. 
uh, and this started like in the eighth grade, I had two volumes of Trump solo transcriptions. Ken Sloan did those books called 28 Modern Jazz Trumpet okay. Books. And I made multiple copies, like 20 copies of every page. And I cut, cut all the lines, as you say. I like that set of licks. I cut all the lines out in two and four bar segments and initialed the player on the back of the piece of paper. Then I would get, I would, I had a whole bag of C major licks. I had a whole bag of D minor G7. And I would never put more than two bars of one player in the same line because I didn't want people to know I was, you know, plagiarizing. So I, I basically would say, all right, that's, Clifford Brown, and that's Blue Mitchell. Does it sound good? And I said, wow, that sounds really good. And I'd write it out, and I'd put my initials on it. And then I'd write that lick out, or that line out, in 12 keys. And I'd write which corresponding chord change would go to those that line. So I was able to read chord changes, and I had no idea why they worked, why, why it sounded good. So I, I was basically bullshitting. My way. Did, you, did you change? Did you change the lines to make them fit your style or your, your substance eventually? Yeah. Yes, I basically and, and I basically and sometimes I would move a note or put a rest and try to make it sound, you know, try to make it sound better. But I wanted to play with people and I wanted to like be in bands, and it didn't seem necessary as a young player or even early days in New York. So I you know people start talking harmony and harmonic concepts. And I was like, oh, shit, I got to go. Because <laughs> I had no clue. But, uh, Joe was talking about us being, uh, us being alumni of some of the last survivors of being in a real big band, not a ghost band. And by a ghost band, I mean... Uh, a band that is led by somebody other than the leader, unlike the Village Vanguard Orchestra, which is, even though Mel is in there, it's still its own band. But let's say, for instance, a Buddy Rich reunion band. A lot of us actually worked with Woody Shaw or, or Buddy Rich, which, which is a very fortunate thing Joe had mentioned yesterday. Uh, I was really fortunate to meet some of my heroes. Uh, I mean... I didn't get to meet Lee Morgan, Kenny Dorn, Blue Mitchell, but I met Art Farmer. I used to see him. I, I knew his ex-wife, and I used to go down to Sweet Basil's every chance I could get to see Art. And Clifford Jordan was there, and I used to hang out with Clifford Jordan until 6, 8 in the morning, and, and I had met Junior Cook, and I used to sit in with Junior Cook at the Star Cafe. I would leave there at 2 in the morning, and I would go to Joyce's, which was an after-hours bar, and play with junior from four to eight in the morning and i'd come out of joyce's well first of all you had to knock on a little speakeasy door they'd open they say oh it's june and they'd let us in <clears throat> and uh, when i left it was like this eye of god the sun was just beating down on us and i would be driving junior home going geez just let me get home and i'll never do this again because we're driving <laughs> so imagine going into joyce's in the in the Tables were mirrors, so you know what's going on. So I'm driving home. I'm going, geez, I'll never do this again. Of course, I was there next week to see Junior and, and play with him and, and bring him the Joyce's. But the story I want to get to is at Sweet Basil's, I met Art Farmer. And some of the epiphanies I've had were going to Barry Harris's Jazz Culture Theater, which is the coolest name you could ever think for a class. <clears throat> the other thing is I met Art, and I talked to Art about a song he had done called Rain Check. Uh, I'll play a little of it for you guys, just for the hell of it. So this, I'm not auditioning or going on. They want... They got to. And I went like this. And I said, Art, I sang it just like I'm singing to you. And I said, Art, what is that? You're, you're playing over an E7, but the notes, like there's a B flat in there, and there's a, there's a, uh, what other, uh, what other notes? A C, you know, notes that didn't belong there. 
And Art took his whole break to explain the Lydian augmented theory from uh, George Russell and explain to me what a um, major minor was, you know. So, so in other words, uh, uh, an E7 is like an F minor major. So it kind of, that was a epiphany for me when I started to really think about dominant chords. The other one was meeting Woody Shaw and, uh, and I studied with Woody Shaw. You know, I used to go to Newark and, and to me, these were like earth moving meetings. Uh, uh, Joe, did you meet heroes of yours that really helped you uh, solidify your type style and type of playing? Well, I, I would I would say they inspired me. So, uh, the, the guys that I got close to, well, I, I also knew Art Farmer a little bit because he played uh, with Lionel Hampton's band a few times as a guest, so I got to know him. And I got to know Sweets Edison one summer. And that was really great. Wow. And that summer I also heard Miles, you know, that was great. But I would say the cats that I kind of hung with were, were Tommy Turrentine. And uh, he was there's a big another Tom. There's another Tom, you know, that's very really important. Well, to you. Tom Harrell, too, of course. I mean, I, I followed Tom Harrell around New York. <laughs> you know, I there was there was a period of uh, in the early 90s where Tom was at Bradley's playing trio at least two or three times a year for a week or sometimes two weeks. And uh, I was there all the time. Man. I was always, yeah. and that was a that was a serious music lesson. Wow. Man. Uh, I heard Freddie Freddie let Tom sit in one time, and Tom was so ferocious. He said, "That's the last time I'm going to do that." <laughs> I Brian mean, Lee. Tom, <laughs> I see uh, Tom at uh, Vanguard, and I would always do this. I'd go sideways, and I go, "Hey, Tom, what mouthpiece are you using?" I like not looking in his eyes for some reason, you know. <laughs> Tom is one of the few cats I would copy. Like I, today, I'm trying. I, I feel like I'm getting my own sound after I turn 50, believe it or not, and I could stand the way I play. Now, that's kind of a late age to say that, That's and that's like a confession. But uh, Tom is one of the few cats I'll copy out three or four choruses of rhythm changes. Otherwise, I'd copy out like Gissy did, four bars, eight bars, and I'll take it, and I'll make it my own and tr transcribe it to different keys. But Tom is such a remarkable player. It's like transcribing a... Clifford Brown or a Freddie Hubbard solo. Uh, would you agree, Joe? Definitely, definitely. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Gissy, did you did you meet guys who really moved you as far as the trumpet or other instruments? Absolutely, and Tom Harrell being one of them. I was I was thrilled to, to meet him and get to talk with him a little bit. Uh, I got Clark Carey, a dear mentor. That's right, Clark. Uh, yeah, and yeah. Bob, yeah. And Bobby yeah. Shue early on. Uh, and Buddy was a hero, so yeah, I've been very fortunate. And then I moved to New York and saw all these guys and uh, players that end up becoming friends, and, and I saw their names on records. And you know, we'd hear we we'd hear about who the like underground cats were that like uh, that weren't hadn't got their their, their uh, deals yet. And uh, yeah, like multiple heroes. I have a funny. Story, though, the first time I got to sit in with Tom Harrell, Art Landy was on the gig. George Robert from Switzerland, the alto player, he, he, it was his gig, and they were playing in Denver. And the drummer was Jojo Williams, a uh, Denver drummer. Well, Tom Harrell asked me what I wanted to play, and I said, Just Friends. And he said, What key? And I said, B flat. And as I mentioned earlier, I knew nothing about harmony. <laughs> so I figured the first part B flat. The song must be in B flat. So I start playing the melody in F, the first 16 bars, and I know it's wrong, but I don't know why. <laughs> and Tom Harrell played the second 16 bars and played it sort of like a Sousa march. He played the melody mm. in the correct key, like, da 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 and then he played like 20 choruses of the most amazing stuff. <laughs> so after the gig, I told Tom Harrell, I said, hey, Tom, sorry about B flat. I guess I meant to call it an F. And he said, yeah, man, that was a special sound. <laughs> <laughs> I laughed so hard. That was completely like, humiliated, but I still loved it. Uh, I'll never forget yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, gentlemen, I 
I'd like to say I'm so thrilled that I could get two of my favorite trumpet players ever in the whole world, masters of the trumpet. I mean, not just, I thought, I wasn't thinking who could I reach, of course, you know, because some of John Marshall lives in Germany. I was thinking who are two of my favorite trumpet players who moved me and, and progressed and lived in New York and I knew and I could call my friends. So I want to sin sincerely thank uh, Masters of the Trumpet, Joe Magnarelli and Greg Gisberg for coming on uh, this show. And uh, we had such a wonderful time talking and I hope it meant something to you younger cats and you older cats. And I want everybody to stay safe, stay inside, save lives. And we're gonna continue this uh, every week uh, I'm, uh, next week, I'm going to be doing piano players, uh, two piano players I work with, Steve Ash and Neil DeGiulio Arsto. And we're going to be doing saxophone players and uh, piano players. <clears throat> Excuse me. But once again, I want to, this is my heart. These are trumpet players. So I want to thank you both for coming on the show. And uh, and guys, stay safe. God bless. And, and we'll stay talk safe, soon. Man. You guys. Thank you. Good. Thank you, brothers. Yeah. All right. All right. Ciao. Bye -bye. See ya.